file um, uh, that I took uh, before. Um, so what you can do is you can record all the data that comes over the air. You can save that in a file, and then you can run the GSM receive on that file, which is uh, what I'm doing right now once I manage to type this line correctly. So basically what it does is it prints you out the hex. Oh, I should increase the font size. That's the So it prints you out the hex sequences for each Mac block. The GSM protocol architecture on the air interface has uh, an architecture where the, I don't know what, you know what uh, where each principal unit, data unit that is communicated over the air interface is a 23 byte, what's called Mac block. You have 23 bytes. Don't ask me why 23. Everything has odd numbers in GSM. It's 51, 26, 23, never any power of two. So the 23-byte Mac block you can see here, you see an awful lot of 2B messages, uh, or 2B hex bytes. 2B is the padding pattern that uh, uh, every GSM frame contains. So um, if a packet is actually shorter than the 23, uh, than 23 bytes, it will get padded with 2B. So you see this packet is actually only, what, uh, six bytes long, and the remaining line is, is just the padding bytes um, to the end of the packet. Um, so you take the actual analog digital samples, um, you call the GSM receiver, and it puts you out the Mac blocks that you receive off the air of the, US, uh, the GSM interface. Now, obviously, the hex bytes are not particularly pleasing to uh, the human uh, receiver. So there is software that you can use um, for decoding it, and that's called GSM decode. Um, and all I do is pipe these hex bytes into GSM decode. And um, once I do that, and I pipe it through less, um, so we actually see something, you get a decode of the message. So on the, on the top, you see the actual, um, the actual message, again, the 23 bytes. And then you get a decode of the individual bytes uh, starting here. So what we see here is a, a radio resource management uh, message, a system information type 4, which is one of these beacons that are regularly broadcasted on GSM. We see, well, the mobile country code is 1, and the network code is 1, um, which is, uh, again, a test network. Obviously, I did not take this capture from, yeah, GSM networks. Switching it off now. Um, so I did not capture this on a real-world network, but I could capture this very well from any commercial network, because the packets I'm seeing here are not encrypted, not on any network. So what I'm seeing is you know, the certain configuration about the cell. I see uh, all kinds of configuration parameters that are uh, relevant to the cell. Now let's go to some other packet. Um, so what we see here, for example, is a paging request. Um, it's a request of the network um, calling a mobile phone uh, to become active, right? Typically, if you just have your phone locked into the network, but you're not using any calls, then the phone will not make any, any actual conversation with the network unless the network wants to deliver a call or you want to make a call. And uh, in that procedure, you page the phone. And what you see is, um, well, there is basically no identity, so it is an empty paging request. So there is no paging um, right now. It's just a, a filling, filling packet. You see some more paging requests with no identity. They're all just filling pattern. Um, then you see things like other system information type frames, uh, system information type 1, system information type, uh, yeah, some, some other system information types, which are all these beacons that are regularly broadcasted. This one is system information two. The system information frames contain information how the network is laid out, what kind of neighbor cells you have, um, what kind of frequency hopping is used, if any. This cell here is not using frequency hopping. Um, uh, but uh, that is, uh, um, uh, this, uh, so it's simpler to actually receive the data if you don't have frequency hopping. If you have frequency hopping, then the configuration of the frequency hopping is also contained in the actual um, unencrypted broadcast beacon packets. So the hopping pattern is public knowledge. It's not that the frequency hopping provides any extra level of security. The frequency hopping is just there to minimize interference. So let's say some uh, interference is on one channel, and you constantly change your frequency, hop to different channels, and you get less interference. But the frequency hopping, many people believe it's a security feature. It is not. 
because the hopping pattern is public. Um, it's publicly broadcasted. So, sorry? Whatever. Um, we, we'll take questions. Uh, either you go to a microphone or uh, I'll take questions at the end of the, the presentation. I cannot understand individual questions. Um, so, um, th this is all broadcasted in that, in that channel. So, you can decode all that. And uh, you can see um, uh, you know, description of the channel layout, uh, how the channels are organized. So based on information that is contained in this broadcast channel, you get an overview of how everything is structured, you know, where the channels are, how they're organized, and so on. And you also see whenever the network activates a particular phone. Um, when you activate the phone uh, using a paging request, you will see the temporary mobile subscriber identifier, which is a, a, temp a number that's temporarily allocated. So you don't immediately can make a connection between the person or uh, the, the subscriber uh, and, and uh, the messages you're seeing here. Um, however, for example, in the network that we're using here on the HAR uh, network, to make it easier for people who want to play with this, in the phone book, we actually print the temporary mobile subscriber identifier of every subscriber. So even if you don't, like in a regular network, you would not know at this level who exactly is being called right now. But in our network, because we provide that information, it's easier to, so the entrance barrier is lower to actually play with this technology and to receive the GSM frames. Um, yeah, you will see not, not actually all too much uh, um, data in here uh, because it's an idle empty cell. It doesn't, it doesn't really have a lot of activity. So most of the paging frames are empty um, and uh, you see uh, no identity here. Um, you can also, um, the GSM receiver also uh, creates a file called gsmreceiver.pcap and gsmreceiverburst.pcap which are two PCAP files in two different formats. Uh, I, know, I, I assume you know a PCAP file is a packet capture that you can use with uh, tools like Wireshark. So um, instead of using this you know, clumsy uh, uh, ASCII console interface, you can open the PCAP file in, in Wireshark, and um, that's what I'm going to do right now. I have to state, um, sorry. I'm not entirely sure whether it will work right now. Um, it's so busy with the pre operating the network and preparing the network here. Um, why did it not? What's the problem? Oh, there is some error mess. Oh, something is messed up. Hmm. Anyway, I can um, I can open a different no. I, OK, so there are some, some patches against Wireshark, which are in the, in the, um, in the repository, in the uh, AirProbe Git repository. Um, here is the Wireshark WTAP GSM patch. I probably have not applied that to my current build of Wireshark. But using the patch, you can, you can then have a more verbose decoding of, of the protocol. Um, st so this is all still unencrypted over the air. Um, starting from the paging request and the paging response, in a regular GSM network, um, the encryption starts to be implemented at that point. So all you can see is basically, OK, a phone is activated, and there is a, a number that you, don't, you cannot immediately associate with a subscriber, and then you see an encrypted connection. Um, however, uh, that encryption has serious weaknesses, uh, which have been documented many years ago and about which uh, the next presentation will be. So if you put all these parts together, right, you have, for example, the possibility to run your own network so you don't get any legal trouble because you're you know, eavesdropping on somebody else and on a, on a commercial network. You have the actual receiver infrastructure here where we can decode frames off the air, can, can put them into their hex bytes, and, and can decode them in protocol analysis tools. So as soon as the encryption, which has already there's cryptographic papers that it has been broken, so as soon as there is a working practical implementation that's readily available, anyone with very little equipment and uh, you know a regular you know Unix-like system.